Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Now, in the course of them being married, remember, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed through Abraham, and it's got to come through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and it's through Jacob where you get your name changed to Israel, where you get the term Israel and Israelites coming from that. So it's one big chronological lineage going on here. It's starting up here. So now Rebecca has two boys. Both of these boys are twins. They're born practically at the exact same time, although one was born first. Now stay with me. In the Jewish tradition, and probably in a lot of our own cultures here, the firstborn gets special rights as the firstborn. The Bible also talks to them that they would get a double inheritance. So if you're the firstborn and you lived in the Old Testament or you're Jewish, you would get a double blessing. You'd get a double inheritance. Now that double inheritance was only allowed to be given to you as long as you followed the plan of the family. You did things biblically, you supported the family, you did what you should for them. You getting that double blessing means when mom and dad die, you're responsible to make sure the rest of the family is taken care of. So in other words, you get a lot of responsibility with that double blessing. So that's something very special. Here's the issue, though. Let's go back to the passage here. Let's look back in the passage here. It says, For though there were twins not yet born and had not done any good deed or any good, good or bad, so that God's purpose would be according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls it. And he said to her, the older, that's the key phrase, going back to the Old Testament now. He's now quoting Old Testament. Said to her, the older will serve the younger. Now keep looking at that. The older would be the very firstborn. All right? Now, that would be the older. Usually, the younger would serve the older because the older is the kind of the, the firstborn. He's the big kahuna on there. All right? But in this case, there was a swap going on in the womb, and it says, but now the older will serve the younger meaning God was larger than charge. He was swapping things around, just as it's written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So God, by his providence, was now showing us that he could do whatever he wanted with two boys that were in the womb. One should be first, but God says, nope, I'm going to swap it around and make the younger be the one that's more in charge, and the older is going to serve the younger by choices that they made, but still God is the one who permitted that and perhaps even prescribed all of that to go on. Not that he made sin happen, but allowed the family to go through some of these things. And this brought this out. And this isn't Jacob I love, but Esau have I hated. Now that gives us a pretty tough time when I think of Jacob and Esau, two guys. Some people say, well, Esau was the real bad guy. Some people say, no, Jacob was the bad guy because he was the deceiver. And that's really what it meant. It's kind of a deceiving God and deceiving these people. So he was the really bad guy. What it was really saying is I'm looking at two guys right here, Jacob and Esau, not based on their works. It wasn't because they were good. It wasn't because they were bad. It wasn't because one was going to be good later. One was going to be bad later. They're both bad. They both needed a redeemer, which would be the Messiah. God says, I've chosen it to be this way. Then he goes on to say those really harsh words. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now, dear ones, I cannot tell you how many hours I have gone through to read How many commentators? I went through the original language. I went to the Old Testament, especially Malachi chapter 1, where that is taken and set in there and then expanded a little bit because now we're beyond the lives of Jacob and Esau. Now they've both got their own families out there and they're now influencing the world and one's influencing them one way and the other's influencing them the other way. And I'm looking at all this and what could it possibly mean? Well, instead of me taking your time today, I'm not going to be able to go through all of the backstory, but here's what I can tell you. That little phrase, hate, is a word that's also used in Matthew and Luke. And the Lord was using those words, uh, that word, in those two places. And he says this. Listen carefully. You probably remember reading this. He says, if anyone does not hate his mother and father, he cannot be my disciple. A couple of other things, but that word hate. If you do not hate your mother and father, you cannot be my disciple. So when we read that, some people say, you mean i got to hate my mother and father in order to really serve the Lord? No, that's not it at all. Theologians like to use this phrase. It's not a Greek grammatical phrase, but it is a phrase of understanding, and it's called a relative preference. A relative preference basically means this, that when you put two things together, because of your love for one so strong, it will appear that you hate the other one. So we cannot draw this that God loved Jacob because Jacob was better than Esau. 
God just chose in his sovereignty, and this gets that rail we talked about at the beginning of the message, that God does this. And some of you are questioning, does that mean God created evil? No, God cannot create evil. We're going to see that in illustration here. Does that mean that since God does this, I have no choice on my own? Yes, there is human choice because we then can do and not do what we want to do, all based on this, and we're going to see that as an illustration. But the bottom line is, God says here that he, relative preference, loved Jacob, relative preference, and hated Esau. Now your question is, can God do that? This is going to separate those true Bible-believing Christians from those that just want to sit back and not really take God at his word. Here it is. God, because he is God, has the right to do whatever he wants to do with whomever he wants to do it in any way he wants to do it as long as it doesn't violate what he's already revealed in his word right here because he is God and the only God whether or not we understand all of it. So let's go back now, if you will. Stay with me in the same passage here because I wanted you to see this whole concept of not of works. Would you underline that? Because we're talking about salvation here. So that's why when God says that it's not of works, these guys got involved. It's not of works for us to get involved in our salvation. God says, you know what? I'm choosing to have you come into heaven not based on how good you are, how many deeds you've done. It's not based on how bad you were. It's based on my selection of you and you're then placing your faith in me as your Savior, in Jesus Christ as the Savior. So we got grace, not race. We got promise, not preference. We have providence, not performance. Now I want to answer some questions by going to the last one, and that is salvation is based on God's mercy and not our merit. God's mercy and not our merit. So follow along, if you will, in your Bible as I go. It says, what shall we say then? There is no justice with God, is there? In other words, what justice? It may never be. Is there any justice with God? For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. So... Then does it not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy? So salvation doesn't depend on man's effort or performance or any of that. It's God's complete mercy that saves us. So God is activating his mercy in us when we do something wrong, not based on our good works, because God chooses to bestow mercy and compassion on whom he will. Mercy is an act. Compassion is probably more of an attitude of God. So why did God choose to use Moses, since he used that as the illustration? Let's go further in verse 17. He brings up now Pharaoh. So he chose Moses to be the person who would lead the the children of Israel out uh, of Egypt and would be the lawgiver. But then he brings up Pharaoh. He says, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, again, all capital, Old Testament, for this very purpose I raised you up. In other words, I put you on historical stage here in Egypt to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be claimed, proclaimed throughout all the earth. So in other words, I've raised you up so that I could show my character to the world based on you and who you are. So then he has, on, so then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. So it sounds like, oh, Pharaoh didn't have a chance. He was real putty and ready to go for God, but God decided to really harden his heart. Now, folks, here's what you need to understand, and I wish I had time to unpack it. When you look at the verses in the Old Testament where it says God hardened the heart of of Pharaoh, you will also see verses where that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Now, let's step back from that just a little bit. God, in his wisdom, knew that Pharaoh would, I believe, harden his heart. Yet it was Pharaoh's choice through the circumstances of life to make choices away from God. And in the course of doing that, we might say that while he was simple and and putty-like, Pharaoh chose by his own free will, because man's free will, the other rail, he then decided like that little clay to roll out into the sun. And that sun now then hardens that clay. So in a sense, that clay decided not to stay in the shade, was hardening his heart, rolling out, doing his own things away from what God really intended for him. And now he is being hardened by God. And now you have what Pharaoh is doing. And if you look at all the different judgments on all the plagues that were there, you'll find each plague represents another part of an Egyptian belief system that they held up as a high value to them. Whether it was the frogs or whether it was the Nile River, whatever it was, was something very high in the belief system for the Egyptians. And then God decided to really show that none of those things have power. I'm the one who has supernatural power all over all of that through my spokesmen, Moses and Aaron. I have mercy on whom I'll have mercy on those that I don't. So everything depends on God's sovereignty. What about man's... Um, 
free will? What about man's responsibility in all of this? Go to verse 19. Paul anticipates that question. He says to them, now listen carefully. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For he resists his will. In other words, if God already has everything planned out, I'm just a pawn or a puppet. It goes on. It says, on the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded, that you and me, will not say to the molder, who would be God, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have the right, God, over the clay, you and me, to make from the same lump one vessel to honorable use? In other words, some will be placed in high honor, places of great visibility, places maybe with a lot of money, prestige, and power and position, and another for common use, working with the common people, perhaps those that are less fortunate. In either way, God chose to make either one, not based on their good works, not based on their bad works. It is that God is large and in charge, and he can do what he wants with whomever he wants, whenever he wants, all for the glory of God, only confined by his own written word. So just like the potter has the right to do what he wants, God has the right to do the same. So now it gets another question. Why would God do that? Stay with me now, if you will. Verse 22 through 24, get your pens ready. Why would God permit evil? Why would God, I don't say he prescribed evil, but why did all of this happen in this world? I think there are at least three possible answers, and they're found right in this passage. It says, Paul speculates. What if God, although willing to demonstrate, speculation, what if? He's saying, what if God did this? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath, that's number one, he did this, to demonstrate his wrath against sin. You will never know that God hates sin unless he demonstrated, unless there was sin revealed for him to demonstrate that. So it was to demonstrate his wrath, that he has holiness, and we know he's holy because he has a hatred for that which is evil. Number two, and to make his power known, which he did, if you remember, with the children of Israel when they were in Egypt, and then he had all those things happen to show his power. He made his power known. He endured with much patience vessels of wrath, that would be sinners like you and me, prepared for destruction. And in the Greek, it actually says more than that. They prepared themselves for destruction. Why did he show so much patience to you and me? I I don't know that, but he chose to do that. His power endured with much patience us who are the vessels of wrath. Number three, he also did this to make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand. That's the sovereignty of God. Beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called part of that predestination. Not from among the Jews only. Woo! Now it goes bigger than the Jews. It goes to all of humanity, but also from among the Gentiles. So what he's really speculating here is what if God did all of that? Can he do this? Yes, he can do this, even if man chooses to step out and do his own sin. So look up here. God then chooses. He wants to make known who he is to the world because he has the right to do that, and we've got to let God be God. That's a phrase you ought to write in your margin. I will let God be God, even when I don't understand it. So he allows the sin to come into the world through Adam and Eve. Through all of that, he now has the opportunity to demonstrate his wrath to that, to let you know how holy he is, how sin is bad, who he is. He has the power over evil as well as the power to bless good. And so now he does all of this to them. At the same time, he is manifesting his power in everything that he does. And I think all of you in some measure have seen God's power work. If anything, when you trusted Christ, some of the things that have been happening in your life, overcoming sin, having the victory that you've learned about in Romans chapter uh, 6, 7, and eight, that power that God has done, not just through miracles and stuff like that, just things in your life that he has done. But he also does this to show to, to the whole world that look at this poor, miserable sinner, Stan Pons. Look at the things that he either said, thought, or did. I'm choosing to make him the way I'm making him, to bring honor to me. I may not be in front of rich people, It may not be working with those that are poor, I'm just who I am. And God is saying, I will be disciplining Stan when he does something wrong. I will show my power to him and I'll also reveal my wonderful mercy and grace so I get all the glory through him. That is the kind of God that we have and we may not understand at all. Well, we're coming to the end of the chapter so let's just bring this to a close here so we can have some closure and we can be done for the day. He brings up two more other Old Testament figures here. Continue on, if you will, very quickly in verse 25. It says this. He points out that Hosea in the Old Testament said this. He says... Also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people. That would be Gentiles like you and me. My people. We become his people. We thought, well, I thought the Jews were his people. They were his people, but we become his people because we now have trusted Christ as Savior. We're grafted in. And her 
who was not beloved, my beloved. Now that's in, you ought to read that. Hosea has three kids. Out of those kids, two of them, um, the, the youngest and the, the second born and the third born, have different names. And those names are now reflected here. Who is not beloved, that was one child's name, is now called beloved. And it should be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. One was referred to in the name, you're not my people. They shall be called sons of the living God. So in other words, God is saying, even though you're not Jewish, as long as you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, you become a part of my family, even though you weren't loved, you are loved, even though you're not my people, you are my people, and you become now a son of the living God when you trust in Christ as Savior. How beautiful all of that is. So in conclusion, what does he say? Verse 30 and 33, 30, 30 to 33. What shall we say then? What, what more can I tell you people here in Rome? He says that Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness attain righteousness. Now, I know some of you are getting foggy right here, but this is coming in for the real, this is it. This is the icing on the cake. This is the center of the filet mignon. He is saying the Gentiles who didn't pursue righteousness, we could almost say not only did they not pursue righteousness, the Gentiles, if you look through the Old Testament, those Gentiles, they pursued the most godless lifestyle. Their belief system and what they did would curl your hair. What they would do with their firstborn is they would dedicate a house is take their firstborn, put that little live baby inside a vase, seal up the vase while the baby was still alive, and then place it inside the wall of a house that they would build. That's what the Gentiles, they did not pursue any form of righteousness. They were actually pursuing depravity at its height. Well, let's go a little bit further. So say so they didn't just pursue righteousness. It says here, even the righteousness which is of by faith, they didn't even want that. They don't work for it. But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness. In other words, they tried to keep the law, the Ten Commandments and everything that was in it. They didn't arrive at that law of faith, which is by faith. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. In other words, I think I can be righteous by my works. And God says, no, 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 you are righteous. I will give you my righteousness when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. And where do we get that? It says, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. Christ is the stone. Christ is the rock of our salvation. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling, referred to as Christ, and a rock of offense, which would be Christ. And he who believes in him will not be shamed. It doesn't say he who behaves. It doesn't say he who believes and behaves. It doesn't even say he who believes. It says he who believes in him will not be disappointed. All right, look up here and we'll be gone. Do you understand God is large and in charge? He can do whatever he wants. He'll select whomever he wants. He is not picking someone to go to hell. Man is going to hell already because they were born with a sin nature and they do by that sin nature sinful things. God is a rescuer. He's a redeemer. He is a savior. So as he looks at mankind, he then in his own infinite wisdom, which we'll never understand, he will select some people then to have eternal life. And when he does that, he selects them based on that person placing their faith in Jesus Christ as their savior. So it's now back into human responsibility where man now must trust Christ because if you don't trust him, you're condemned already only because you haven't believed in Jesus Christ, John three sixteen through 18. So there's that two rail track. God's choosing, man must make his own choice. I don't understand it all. All I can say is this. You heard the message now. Are you one of God's eternally elect because you placed your faith in Christ? And the only proof of if you're his elect or not is if you trusted Christ as your savior. And I want to give you that chance right now, right here, because it's whosoever you are, whatever kind of person you are, if you place your faith in Christ, this God who is large and in charge now becomes not only your God, He is already your Lord, now He will become your Savior when you trust Christ as your Savior. I'm so glad it's not based on works. My example of that, Jacob and Esau said it's not by their works that He chose faith and faith alone. Let's pray, shall we? Yes, there will be a coming together of the Jewish nation. God has a plan for their life. But in the center of that plan will always be the person and work of their Messiah, Jesus Christ. But that's them. This is you. This is now. Have you accepted the payment Christ made for you on the cross? No matter how much God might set aside Israel, He never abandoned Israel. I just read a newspaper article that came from a leading spokesman representing Iran that said that they now have 80,000 missiles pointed directly at Tel Aviv, 
in Haifa, in Israel. So at just a word and a few emails and a couple of communications, tens of thousands of missiles could be unleashed and rained down on Israel. If that even happened, God would not wipe Israel off the map. Israel will always remain the Jewish people on his map of history because he promised that through them the nations of the world would be blessed that would be Gentiles because Jesus Christ came through them and so there is a preservation for the nation we don't know what it will all look like in the decades ahead of us should the Lord not come back but we know one thing they'll always be Jews other civilizations will come and go but not Israel. But now how about you? Have you come to a point in your life that you've been really struggling with where you're going to go when you die? Have you thought about that? Are you in a particular job that puts you in the harm's way, whether you're a first responder or military? Are you at an age right now that you're suffering from some health and you worry about what's going to happen to you? Have you had a loved one or someone you know die recently? You read about it and began the spirit talking to you inside, not words, but just this little bit of fear of, where am I going when I die? God in His sovereignty brought you here today to hear a message with four foundational principles. It's by grace, not race. It's by His promise and not preference. It's by His providence, not performance. It's by His mercy, not merit, doing something good. So would you come to Him right now on a in a humble state saying, Lord, I, I know I can't ever get to heaven. My good works are never good enough to get there. I'm coming to you just as I am. And so, Father, you sovereignly had me hear this message. And so I want to place my faith in Jesus Christ by believing what he said in Scripture, that if I would trust him as my Savior, my sins would be all forgiven forever. And I would have eternal life. So, Lord, I do not want to stumble over the stumbling block that was born in Israel, in Zion. But I want to stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ and enjoy my salvation, my faith alone. If today is the day that you want to make sure of your salvation, I'd like to pray for you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand because I want to pray for you. Raising your hand won't save you. Walking an aisle won't save you. Filling out a card won't save you. And of course, me praying for you won't save you. But if you're trusting Christ today, you're calling upon the Lord as your Savior. I just want to pray for you because you were saved the moment you trusted Christ. Now I'm just kind of welcoming you into God's family. You're not joining the church. just God's forever family. Would you let me do that? I won't embarrass you. I won't come to you. I won't mention your name. You, you, you ought to go public with your faith for sure, but that's not a part of salvation to get saved. I just want to pray for you, my friend. Wouldn't you like to have a friend to do that? So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if today is the day you're trusting Christ, and you'd like for me to remember you in my prayer. Would you slip up your hand right now? Would there be anyone today that's ready to trust Christ? Put your hand up. All right, Christians. I pray for all of us today that we'll just relish the fact that God does love us and He is sovereign. And that in His sovereignty, He has chosen for us now to follow His word by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that there'll be those that'll hear this message and that they would trust you as their Savior, Father. And that it's a desperate plea for them that none of them would perish, but all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, for all of us that we will truly worship a God who is large and in charge and sovereign. And that we'll accept the fact that there are secret things that belong to you that we'll never know, and that's okay. And that your ways will always be higher and greater than our ways and our knowledge but also not to use that as an excuse not to study your word and to get, go deep and understand it from a biblical point of view and making sure that it all blends together. Help us to understand that. Now, Father, also help this to propel us into sharing the gospel to those who are around us that need Jesus Christ, that you told us to go into all the world, and that would be our world, and explain that message to others because we don't know who will or will not trust Christ. We're given that job to do that. So help us now, Father, to do it. 
in loving, submissive obedience to you. In your name we pray. Amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.